Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We are going to give folks a chance to get into the webinar. It always takes a few minutes because there's a lot of you coming in all at once. So we're just popping in a little bit early so that we can get everybody in before we get started. We do have the chat box open today. And as usual, if you would like to let us know if you're a first timer with us or if you've been here multiple times and where you're coming from, that's always super fun. We get to see where everybody's coming in from. Um, we typically get people from, from, from right here in Texas, but also around the world. And yes, our first one is from Germany. Jennifer, great to see you. Garnet from the Railroad Commission. She's right across the street from us when we're on campus. And then we've got Dallas out to Phoenix. I see a shout out for, for Gay from Austin. <laughs> Wonderful. They're coming in fast now. Mexico City, Singapore, Corpus, Vermont. Thank you very much. Welcome. We've got everybody from Dallas to Minnesota, San Antonio, and out to Florida. A first timer from Austin, welcome, thanks for joining. Atlanta, back right here to, to Austin, Wichita Falls, thank you so much for joining. For those of you just popping in now, we're just giving everybody a chance to come in and I'm just watching the chat fly in. Everybody's letting us know if they're first timers. Um, Karen says she watches all the time, so thank you very much and welcome back. And then we have a lot more people coming in from Oregon and from from ACC, from Colorado, from California as a first timer. Welcome, so much fun to see all of you. We're just gonna give about another 20 seconds for everybody to get in. We've had hundreds of people sign up for this and we know when we open the room, it takes just a couple of minutes for everybody to actually um, get admitted into the room. So thank you so much for being here. Joining from Cedar Park comes a lot, I love it. And first timer from Arlington, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Portugal, fantastic. Great to see this. This is our opportunity to see people from around the country and around the world get a chance to join us. And we really appreciate you doing that. All right. Well, we have a lot to cover today, so I appreciate it. And we'll continue to watch the chat as more and more people are coming in. It's great to see all of you, but we do wanna go ahead and get started. So hello, and thank you for joining us for Characteristics of a Leader, advice from two straight shooting female CEOs. I'm Lynn Slattery, Director of Open Enrollment Programs at Texas Executive Education at the Macomb School of Business. And along with my colleagues, we started last spring trying to put together a few webinars for people just so that we could keep connected. We do miss being on the 40 acres and we want to make sure that learning is not stopping just because we're not able to always be together and bring our thought leaders to you. Before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping things to cover with you. This is a little bit different than our previous webinars. Um, we are going to still have you all with your cameras disabled and your microphones muted. We'd love to see, your, see and hear and talk with all of you, but as I said, there's hundreds of you there and just not possible to do that. This session is being recorded and that recording will be sent to you after the webinar is completed so that you will have that to view again or to share with other people. Now it is my pleasure to introduce your panelists and your moderator for today. Gay Gaddis is the founder of T3, formerly the largest female-owned digital agency in the U.S., best-selling author of Cowgirl Power, How to Kick Ass in Business and in Life, and Celebrated Artist. Gay shares her grit, resilience, and perseverance through her entrepreneurial efforts, empowering women worldwide. Also with us on the panel is Lynn Utter. Lynn is a former CEO and a Fortune 500 board member. She offers a unique perspective on how to successfully create value and ascend to C-suite as a female executive. Lynn is committed to helping rising women accelerate their careers by sharing her real world, corporate experiences and skills. And your moderator for today is Dr. Melissa Murphy, founder and chief communication coach of the Pitch Academy and award-winning lecturer and scholar at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Murphy currently teaches business communications, negotiation, and entrepreneurship at the Macomb School of Business. In 2019, she was selected to teach in the Kendra Scott Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Institute. And in 2020, she helped launch the very first Texas chapter of the Women's Network at the University of Texas, dedicated to helping women succeed professionally. Welcome to all three of you. And Dr. Murphy, I will turn it over to you to begin. 
Thanks so much, Lynn. Um, and everyone from around the world, thank you so much for joining us. It's truly an honor to be here with these incredible women that I've gotten to know this week. Um, and thanks uh, to those of you at Texas Executive Education for putting this webinar on and for sending in your questions ahead of time. So we're, we encourage you to use that chat, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna get right into it with our first questions because we have about 45 minutes and it's gonna go very quickly. So we're gonna just start off with our first question. And this one is for Lynn first. So tell us how you first met Gay and what is it about her leadership style that captured your attention? And if you have a favorite story about her to share, we'd love to hear it. Well, so first of all, it's my pleasure to be here. And I, I send greetings to all of you all over the world. It's awesome. Um, you know, I, so, so speaking of the world, I met Gay in Latvia. Um, there was the, the U.S. State Department several years ago, this goes back 20 years, um, asked a handful, actually a couple dozen women from the U.S., to travel to Latvia and, and serve as, as mentors for women from the former communist bloc, right? And so I didn't know anybody in that trip. Um, I headed over there. It was actually a phenomenal experience, but I met this woman, Gay Gaddis. And full disclosure, so Gay, um, Gay is, you can't tell on Zoom, Gay is a petite woman, but man, she has got flair. I mean, she, had, she always was the best dressed in the room. She was a marketing executive. And I just remember thinking, wow, that's, that's an, interest. And, and look, by the way, I was at the time very corporate. I had my blue suits on, my, my boring, you know, I was boring. So, so I sort of, yeah, that was my first impression of gay. And actually, actually, I remember her having this brooch with like feathers on it. And I was like, oh my God, that was so out there. But, but about two years later, um, that same group was asked to go this time to the Middle East and do a similar um, mentoring group in the Middle East. And this time I was asked to go back as was gay. This time gay's on the panel. Like now she's made the big time. She's actually up there speaking. And that's when I went, wow, she has, she's powerful, she's strategic, she was so composed. I thought, okay, I shouldn't just discount her. I'm just, you know, as this marketing, you know, kind of crazy marketing person. Um, and actually at Coors, I had, I had, we're doing some work in digital. This goes back way back. And so I called her firm. I, I didn't know Gay Gaddis. I called the firm T3. They were so smart and I was so impressed. So it was, really good work. Gay was strategic, smart, thoughtful, powerful. And look, it was one of my first experiences around how not to judge a book by its cover. I mean, I'm going to be full, full on honest. Like I had this bias of this sort of marketing creative that didn't frankly fully appreciate her extraordinary grit and intelligence and leadership. So that's my early years with Gay. <laughs> So Gay, now your turn. Uh, what were your first impressions of Lynn and how have they evolved? And if you have a favorite memory about her during that time, please share. Oh, yes. Well, you know, I came at this from a different point of view. I was like Lynn. I didn't know really anyone at this event, maybe someone in Latvia, I think back on it now. But I remember standing around a, a buffet table and meeting Lynn and talking to her and being so impressed by just her force of nature. That's the only way I can say it. You would never not want to talk to Lynn because she just owned a room. Uh, she was bold, uh, but yet not bra abrasive. You know, I have to say it, she had kind of maybe the velvet hammer side of it. But what I was very impressed with as I got to know her, and she mentioned her tenure at Coors, is that here was a woman who was not only in the C-suite with men, but in a man's industry at Coors and had ascended into a role of leadership. And I would love to hear her stories about how she would have to dress appropriately if she was going to be in the factory or if she's going to be on the road or what she had to do. And, um, and so I looked at her and I think everyone did as a real role model. How many women did we know that had made it to that level and played in a man's world and succeeded? So I was in awe of that. I thought it was in incredible. Um, she's also a great listener. And that's a trait of a, of a great leader. Uh, leaders who are always just, even though she's an extrovert, and I knew that, and she's very engaging, uh, but she listens to people. And then not just listens, but then is able to take that information and then bring it back at the appropriate time and way to really make a difference. So that's a very strong characteristic of a leader, as we've named this uh, seminar today. Um, she's also a doer. 
you know, some people say, but don't do, but Lynn gets things done. And as bold, like I said, she'll jump in, get it done and roll up her sleeves and make things happen. And I will tell you a fun story. Uh, a few years ago, several of my female uh, colleagues, uh, and Lynn was one of them, uh, came out to our ranch which is where we live and most of the time in uh, the hill country near Austin. And so we're real ranchers. I mean, this isn't just a weekend uh, drugstore cowboy thing. We're, we're, we're real ranchers. We raise Texas Longhorns and make hay and have horses and, you know, the whole bit. And so here comes Lynn out there and she was the first one to jump on a bulldozer, not afraid at all, very confident and said, yeah, I'll do it, you know, and no matter what we threw at her when she, when she was at our ranch visit, she was the first to jump into the fire. So I always admired that just can do, you know, I'm not afraid, I'll take it on. So I admired her always for that. And then of course, the last thing is just staying power. And if there's ever a characteristic of a leader that we should all think about, it's the ones who hang in there and they've got staying power. It, there's kind of a glory in the grind, as I like to say, you know, every day isn't glamorous, every day isn't it fun, and, and as my husband would always say, it's not all roses and bluebirds, but someone who's got staying power is the one who's going to make it to the finish line, and I saw that in Lynn early on. Well, speaking of leadership uh, traits and profiles, it seems you're both very successful business executives, yet you offer very different leadership profiles. So how do you reconcile those differences? Well, I, don't know, I can throw it back to Lynn, but you know what we appreciate about each other and we're in an organization called the Committee of 200 or C200 and it's half entrepreneur and half corporate. And corporate women have different goals, they have different strategies and they have different ways that they have an impact. Uh, entrepreneurial women come at it from a different way. And for a lot of us who bootstrapped our business from the ground up, there's a real grit there, uh, you know, that comes from that and a real determination and a vision thing. So I, I think what's interesting about what Lynn and I bring, uh, and when we even consult with each other on things, is that I really appreciate her understanding sometimes the politics of business, you know, and what it takes to make it through that, and how you have to really understand uh, how to play that game. And it's not just a game, but I mean, it's, it's a tough thing. I was doing things my way. <laughs> you know, I could make decisions when I wanted to because I didn't have anyone to answer to except for my clients. So I was kind of my own person doing my own thing. But I came to a great appreciation by being around people like Lynn and what she brings is that there are ways to get things accomplished and done, but you do it by bringing people along. And, and you can't just say, this is my way, we're gonna do it this way. You've got to come up with the right analytics strategies and approach to make a difference. And that's what I appreciate and what she brings. And, you know, I kind of come from, at it from a, a little different point of view, but definitely coming together, it makes a lot of sense. Well, and I just have to throw in, so look, so Gay, Gay, by the way, Gay, those are really gracious uh, comments and observations to make about me, but I, listen, Gay, Gay may have had more leeway, if you will, in running her own business as an entrepreneur, but I will tell you, there's nobody, and I think this is, again, a, a trait of a leader, nobody that I know who does a better job of assessing her own skills, what she brings, what her own superpowers are, what she knows and brings to the table, and thinks about the rest of the team, Right. And what, what they bring, what she needs to bring to that whole, she, she, she thinks about where, you know, from whence people come and how to get the best out of a team. Like, frankly, and I've seen Gay run her own business. I've seen her run not-for-profits. And I think that is actually really important. And back to your question, Melissa, I think that ties into, look, women, all leaders, I don't think there's one leadership style that's successful, right? There are some that are more successful in business, but I think Gay and I are great examples. There's not one profile for how women must behave in the workplace. Now that said, I think we come at this, you know, men, I'll say white men, you know, typically that's where who've been the most in most power positions in, in, in businesses for decades, right? They sort of get accepted to the table because they're a white male. The rest of us, we're, we're sort of these other people, these other profiles. And so we have to prove ourselves. And so this notion of, you know, you asked about, I do think women in particular, have to learn to adapt to some degree. We've got to figure out how to flex. It does not mean changing your fundamental style every day, but it, it's knowing the situation you're in and figuring out how to be taken seriously and how to get credibility. Um, 
and it's a narrow band. Look, there's a narrow band here. If we're too aggressive, you know, we're bitches. Um, excuse me, but you know, there, and 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 that, by the way, I have seen is true in a lot. You know, so some of those old cliches they have some reality to them. But I think I think at the end of the day, because we learn to adapt so well, it actually makes us better leaders to figure out how to tap into different types of people. When thinking about adapting. Um, what do you make of these generalizations that profile women as more or less of a particular trait? So more collaborative, less willing to speak up in a group versus their male counterparts. What do you make of that? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll start again. I'll let you, I'll let you. So I'll start. So look, I think that first of all, I have, I've led lots of, lots of teams, lots of people. And I will tell you, there are, there, there is some truth to these generalizations, right? About how um, I do see women and I, and I coach women a lot find your voice, find a way to have yourself be heard. And I have watched the phenomena, right? This whole mansplaining where a woman, I've watched it. I've watched it in boardrooms. I've watched it in conference rooms. I've watched it happen where women will make a comment and then a guy comes in and says it and they get credit. And having said that, part of this is we've got to learn to find our voice, how to find with credibility. And so some of those generalizations I think are true. Um, some of it, as I mentioned a moment ago, this what, what I, the research calls the double bind Right, women a lot of times you know, we're coached to find our voice, and then we then we go a little bit over the edge, and what is assertive for a man becomes inappropriate for a woman, and so there, we have a narrower band of what fits, and the research bears that out. So the challenge is how again how do you navigate those those waters, and figure out what works in different situations without losing who you are. Well, I have one thing that goes for anyone in a leadership role, and that is the way that you have a voice at the table and the way that you have the have earned the right to speak up and be heard is that you've got to do the hard work and there's no way to replace it. You've got to know your stuff. You've got to learn about it. You have to study it. You have to ask people. You have to do your research. And once you become really competent at something, then that gives you the confidence and the right to be heard in the room. But no one can leave that aside. I mean, you can BS your way through a lot of stuff, but to truly be a leader, you've got to know, you have to be an expert at it. You've got to really understand the material, the context, you know, this market situations, everything that you're dealing with, the finance part, very much the finance part. And so once you have that, then, you know, you've earned it. You've earned a seat and you should speak up and not let anyone go over you because you have something to offer and then you feel good. It continues to build your confidence. Here's a big question coming, uh, ladies. So picking up on the notion of staying on track, mm -hmm. research shows that women have fallen out of the workplace at a higher rate than men and COVID has only exacerbated this problem. So should we even try to keep more women in the workforce? And what if they genuinely want to stay home with their families and have the ability to do so? Okay, okay, I'm going to jump in because this one is so, near, I know it's near and dear to both of our hearts, but uh -huh. look, I, 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 I know what it's like. I'm a mom, I'm a, I was a working mom. Um, I raised two kids. It is hard. And there were a couple of times in my career where I almost, you know, I, I looked at my husband and I said, do we keep, what, do, do we keep doing this? I was traveling. I had a lot going on. Um, Gay was with me one night when my daughter called me and I, you know, I just, it, there were a couple of times I said, is this all worth it? But I will tell you it was worth it. And so I think about it this way. It's long-term and short-term. There is, there is, and Gay just said it, look, nothing in life that is worth having is easy. I have to, I happen to believe that. Um, and so I do think finding the resources, finding the support network, finding the perspective to stay in for the short-term when it's really hard so that you're there in the long-term. I have so many, I'm not saying this is everybody, but I have so many girlfriends. I have a Stanford MBA. I've got a U University of Texas McCombs undergrad. I have, I've had the best education, literally. I wouldn't trade either of them. And I have lots of female executive friends who I've gained, who I've had over for many, many years. And I will tell you that so I have, I have way too many who opted out in those really tough years of trying to figure out how to, how to manage it all, who then have some version of remorse or regret later on. And I can't, I mean, I, and by the way, the research bears this out. And so I, listen, for those who want to stay home, you know, I, I almost did it. Okay. I almost did it. So I get pull. But I will also say, I am so glad I, I stayed in because the long-term, once you get off track, I've just seen so many women, they think they'll go back in a year or two or they'll think they'll, you know, 
and it just doesn't happen. It is just too hard. And there are so many forces pulling you back. So I'm really passionate. I will do everything I can to help women succeed on the path that they, and I, and again, in undergrad, women talk about, they want careers. They is equally as men. They talk about, they want careers. They want families. They want it all just like the men do. I want to help more women see that game through. Yeah, I have to say, and chiming in with what Lynn's saying, I've had the same thing. I've had so many women that I've coached or came to me or had remorse, you know, and, and what am I going to do? I've been out of the game for eight years. And every time I would, I almost didn't have a solution for them. You know, I would say, well, you can get back. What's even made it more difficult now is that technology is, as when we have all seen that <laughs> over the past year, but technology has moved at such a pace that if you are out of the game and you haven't kept up with that, it's almost impossible to get back in. So if you can just, I'm a mom of three. I know I can tell you all the stories and how difficult it was and how, you know, I missed the Japanese play that my daughter was in and I was, you know, thrown into the guilt chamber by my mom and, you know, the whole thing, you know, we've been there. But had I not stayed in the game, I couldn't have given my children some of the things that I gave them later. And one woman that I have a, a great deal of respect for who we've had this conversation many times and she was a, an executive at Dell and she said, I'm so glad that I didn't quit when I almost did because she said, now as my children are in their 20s and into their own careers, I can really be an active participant in that. I can advise them. I can talk to them like a business person. And she said, it's made all the difference in our adult relationship. And so you kind of have to look down the road. You know, they're only going to be young so long. And if you can get the help at all costs, whatever it takes, get the help and hang in there because you've got the rest of your life left. You know, we all do. We've got um, many, many years that hopefully we can be productive. And if you stayed in there and, and kept the options open, that's what I always say. I hate to see people close doors. And even if you're freelancing or even if you're consulting or doing something where you're in the game so that you're not completely left on the sidelines and that keeps the options open for you later in life. I'm going to, Melissa, forgive me. I'm going to tell one quick story if I can. I, I actually, and I, I'm now I'm speaking to those of you out there who may be moms, maybe dads, by the way, I'm not assuming all the everyone listening is a female here. Um, you know, I, my, I raised my kids, as I said, I was traveling and, and we relocated once. My husband and I made the choice once to relocate. We didn't want to do it every couple of years. We did it once. And I was, I had moved, the, the family hadn't followed. We, I, anyway, we we're in an airport. Everything's crazy. Life is crazy. We're trying to get these kids moved across the country. And we were, I'll never forget, we're in the Denver airport. And I had, you know, a gold card to get through the fast lane in the airport because I traveled so much. And we're late running to the, to the plane. And so I go and I said, okay, kids, come over in this line. And, and we go to the front of the, whatever, short line that had, because my, whatever gold card I had, and my daughter was horrified. We're all, you know, she's like, oh my God, we just cut in line. I've taught my kids to be real followers. And, um, you know, and, and we, so we get through, we put our clothes back on, we put our shoes back on. I'm like, come on kids, come on kids. And my daughter stopped me. She was probably, when we moved, she was nine, I think. Um, and she stopped me and she said, and I, I actually, when I was getting in line, I had said to her, I said, I know Ellie, I know we are cutting in line, but this is the one time it's okay. Cause this gold card, it makes it okay. The rule is okay. I know mommy, I know it's crazy, but this is how it works. We got through the other side and she stopped me. She actually stopped me and said, mom, I want you to know, I'm proud of you. You don't have to apologize for working. I'm proud of you. And I can't make this up y'all, a nine-year-old and that was my moment of our kids see us when we are vibrant and fulfilled. And where, th where there are some things my kids missed out on, sure, but what, what parent doesn't miss something? And to be able to give my kids a role model of a mom who, who loves them and loves what she does, that's the long-term gain I talked about a second ago. So anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt with that story, but. Okay, you know I love stories, so we can keep them coming. Um, so let's talk about responsibility as business leaders and managers on these calls and business owners. What can we do to keep more women in the workplace? Make sure they don't drop out. What ideas y'all have? Well, we have something cooking right now that will help some people. <laughs> if we, I'm not sure we're going to jump to that yet, but one thing that is very important is that we all have to think about this. And, and when I was kind of coming up in my career, there were not that many women who reached out to help me. 
I didn't really have women mentors and they weren't giving me a hand up. They were, and I always laugh and say, I have scars on the top of my hands because I was trying to crawl up the ladder and stiletto heels were hitting me as I was going up the rungs. They didn't care. They didn't look back. Um, and so there were a few, I'm not saying all women, but by and large, women were not helping women. We have to kind of recast that and the more that we can help each other and stand up for each other and give each other confidence and courage and encouragement to hang in there, to do well, to take that next risk. Because I found as an entrepreneur, one of the greatest gifts that I had, fortunately, was that I was a risk taker and I was, a, I was willing to try things and take risks. We have to teach women that it's okay to take a risk now and then. If you make a mistake, we got you, you know, and somehow you'll recover. We've got to help other women understand that they can have the confidence. They can do these things. They don't need to be apologetic. Uh, I was on a call the other day with a, a women's network and several of them said, wow, you know, I, I just feel like I have to apologize because I'm not coming in on time or my kids are doing this. And I said, no, stop. Do not apologize. Do your work. Do what you've got to get done. But be confident that you're there because somebody wants you to be there. And the other thing that I didn't even know what it meant a few years ago was someone asked me about this imposter syndrome thing. And I said, well, what is that? And they said, oh, well, you know, you're in a role that you don't really feel like you can do it. I said, wait, stop. Stop the self-deprecation here. You've got to put that behind you. Someone thought you could do this role. If someone promoted you and put you in that place, they believe in you. So believe in yourself and step up and you can do it. It may not seem easy, but you can do it. So again, I think the big picture here is let's help each other. Let's share like what we're doing right now. Let's give people ideas and strategies and the confidence to continue to do great things. You know, and I'll throw into this, I, I was so lucky. I, I continue to be lucky. I had extraordinary mentors and sponsors, I will say, both at Frito and at Coors in particular, when I was, when I was in my you know, early parts of my career. I mean, I had Leo Kiley at Coors, he put me in jobs that I didn't know I could do, much as what Gage just said. He put me in charge of a manufacturing plant. I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I said to him, I said, Leo, why me? Why now? And he said, because you've never failed me. Because I need, you know, there's a, this, this division contributes a certain part of, to, our, to our profit and loss every year. I need you to keep on that. I listened to him. And, I, and I, frankly, it also, he changed my perspective on how to create value in a company. So look, I, and by the way, I did it. I literally, I tripled the EBITDA in that division. And I did it because I, I did what Leo asked me to do. I, you know, I have, but I didn't know that I had that in me. So some of this is giving women, you may not see them. You may, and, and I've seen way too many people assume women don't want bigger responsibility, don't want to relocate, don't want whatever. And by the way, sometimes we don't. I remember once I, I was offered a promotion and I wasn't sure I could do it with little kids at home. And so I literally called the, the previous guy's assistant. And I said, tell me his schedule. Tell me his, you know, how did he run? How did he do this job? I want to think through it. Turns out he golfed literally <laughs> twice a week during business hours. So I was like, okay, if he can golf twice a week, I can take one morning off a month and go volunteer in my kid's kindergarten room. And that was that. And I told my CEO, that's how I'm going to make this work. I'm going to be a mom. So look, I think I say all this. I had great mom. I had great mentors and sponsors. So if those of you out there who are leading teams, be that great mentor or sponsor, give folks, give women shots. Um, you know what? If they fail, they fail, but help them learn. But I doubt it. I think more often than not, we're, we're pleased by what, what, what people can contribute. And secondly, just have open conversations. You know, my conversation with Leo about, look, I'm going to take one morning a month and be in my son's kindergarten classroom. And he was like, great, go to it. I, you know, and so, but I had to have courage to go to my CEO and ask for that time. So I think this notion of having open conversations, building bridges to meet each other where we are, we just got to do more of that. And I hope that COVID has, frankly, this work from home environment has given us even more confidence to have more of those conversations. So you're both working on something very exciting. Um, the new women's executive development program called Women Who Mean Business. So why is this program important and why now? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, we're so excited about this and, you know, when you let in the other day is what what can we really do now and in our way lynn and i are both you know bleed burn orange uh we have been you know both fortunate enough to be named to the hall of fame 
uh, by McCombs. And so we've also had this great relationship through the years. And it just seemed like the timing was absolutely right. And I have to say that COVID certainly has exacerbated all these issues that we've talked about, but we were seeing it before too. You know, we were just what we've been talking about, that women would sometimes opt out and just say, okay, I can't take the pressure or I'm not gonna take that promotion or I'm not gonna move to that next big opportunity because I just, I just can't do it. I'm just gonna step to the side. So what Lynn and I are excited about is what we said earlier too, is that we come at it from a little bit two different points of view, which I think is more of a well-rounded view of the real world experience that we can talk about. And we're gonna get into, you know, case studies and real conversations and what if, and gosh, I don't know if I can make this work or how am I going to negotiate for this? We're gonna really get into the nitty gritty. And so no theories, no charts and graphs on analytics. This is gonna be the real real thing, um, but we're excited. We'll have, uh, we're taking uh, nominations right now. Um, and you can see about that in the chat, but we want to get in the group and our first thing that starts in the fall it starts in September and uh, Lynn can tell you more about the details of that but and more what she thinks of this but we're hoping to get up to 50 women no more because we want it to be not a huge group we want to have real hands-on experience but it's our way of somehow giving back to women uh, that are looking for that next big thing and so it's for women who've been in the workforce probably five years or more. And they're now ready to say, okay, what is it gonna take to get me to that next level or possibly the C-suite? Or And we're, we're saying entrepreneurs, join us. Corporate women, join us. Uh, we'd like to see uh, be a mix so that we have a diverse group of women uh, from different industries as well. Because I think a lot of times, you know, when you're in an industry, you get to go to conferences and things that are very vertical and they're in that industry, but it's very nice to be across different types of backgrounds and industries so that you get a feel for what's going on. And then last of all, and then I'm, I will let Lynn give her two cents on this. We want to build a community because it's all about connections. And so if Lynn and I can introduce these women to some other senior strong business leaders, uh, if we can help them connect with each other and have maybe a lifelong network of women that they can talk to, because that's where we need each other. It's the support we have to have when the chips are down. If I can call a friend of mine who's another woman, maybe working in another company saying, wow, I got a real ringer thrown at me today. What do I do? Or how am I going to make it through it? Or could you help me with this? Yeah, we'll do it. So that's what this is all about in a nutshell. Yeah, and I'll just, look, I'll throw in, I think, in my experience, there, there are really three key elements, I think, to help help anybody, but especially women grow their leadership skills. One is, one are some of the frameworks and the ideas and the notions about, you know, how do you create value in a company? How do you, how, you know, what, how do you communicate? How do you, how do you lead a team? How do you really inspire and motivate a group of people that may not look like you, right? That the, how do you build executive presence, right? To be able to communicate with, with, with power and authority and credibility. Um, how do you how do you really understand yourself? Self awareness, tapping into your own superpowers. As I mentioned, you know, Gay is so good at this. So I think there's some of this which is really building a knowledge base. And look, I happen to be a believer. We all need to go back to school, whatever that might be. And by the way, Zoom helps us. We're going to do this program in person. But I just think we've, in the last year, we've learned reconnecting and, and going through some learning experiences. I think you got to do it every few years in your career to stay vibrant, to stay relevant, to really think back on what do I know, what do I need to learn. So there's some content. In addition to that, I look as, and we just, we said this. I think exposing women and our intention is in this program to bring in high-profile leaders, other members of the Hall of Fame, male and female. By the way, I saw a question. The quote: Men can be great mentors and and gifts, and they can be our allies. We just got to figure out how to work together for the same goals. Um, so bring together the Hall of Fame women, other advisory council members, other CEOs. Um, so to give folks role models and not just up on a pedestal. But connecting and asking questions and be able to have a we're, CEOs are people who we put on you know we put on our skirts and our pants you know one leg at a time they're human and so sharing what we've all learned along the way I think is helpful and then as Gay just mentioned the third element of this program really is creating networks peer networks where you know when and I can't tell you when, you know, how many times when I've thought about changing roles and I've only done it three or four times in my career you know being able to pick up the phone and call women people that I trust and say. How would you think about this opportunity? But you got to learn how to not just have a social connection, but how to network for, for purpose. 
how do you make an ask? I, I, when I went into private equity, I didn't know how private equity worked. All right. So I learned how to ask. And I, and I, it's amazing when you ask people, they'll share term sheets, they'll share, you know, equity you know, uh, um, situation. You know, they'll, they'll help, they help me with a secret decoder ring of how does private equity work? So my, so I think having these peer networks, having senior level, um, you know, successful folks you can talk to, and also having some frameworks from a, from a course content standpoint, I think those three things together, we all need to be investing in ourselves um, with those sorts of resources and tools. So important to be able to ask for help. And um, I know I asked for help during my master's and PhD program for sure. And we have a number of um, colleagues that are so helpful here at McCombs as, as I navigate my own career here. Um, so we've got a couple more questions, but one for each of you. And then I've got some audience questions that we'll end with. Um, so let's go with Gay first. What closing words of advice would you offer the women who are watching? And so let's, let's start with you, Gay. One of the main things that I hope to leave everyone with is this, that you really are great and believe in yourself. Uh, Lynn said something that I'm really, really keen on, and that is that we have to harness our strengths. And so however you find that with a 360 peer review by taking a Myers-Briggs type indicator or whatever it is, start to really get your head around your strengths because you've got them. And then find situations where those two things come together, where your strengths and situation match up, and then you become more and more successful. Uh, and leave behind the things you don't do well. Don't worry about that. You know, we all have our weaknesses. We all have things we'll never do very well. Don't angst about those. Leave them behind and find other people who do those well and surround yourself with those folks. So it's really kind of just being celebrating your strengths, knowing what they are and putting them full forward out there and you will really, really find your stride. It makes you so happy uh, when you were doing things that are, are built on just how you're wired up who you are and you can't be someone else you aren't. So, and as Lynn said earlier, and I think this is a very important thing for me to kind of leave on with this, is that there is no one style, there's no one personality type that makes the perfect leader. You know, there are traits of leaders that we see in personality types, but everyone has their own unique leadership style and we could all be leaders. It's a noble thing to lead. Think about that, people need encouragement they need leadership we all need it and so to rise and say I'm going to do this and I'm good at this and I'll take the lead on that that's a good thing and it brings a lot of joy for you uh, and challenges sometimes but it helps others fantastic hey Lynn um, what closing words of advice would you offer the employers mm, oh gosh so 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 for the so for um Okay, so so she changed the question on me, but I, I, I can go with this. So um, first of all, I just want to I, I want to say the women, and I and I'll segue to the employers. Embrace your ambition. Ambition is not a word that I grew up wanting to call myself. It sounded it it was all kinds of negative I had about. It. I don't want to be ambitious. I don't want to. But but the fact is, you no one would be on this call if you didn't strive to be wanting to be wanting to you know embrace your leadership potential and see that through. And that applies to employers as well. For those who are on this call, right, whether you are here to figure out how you can help your, the women in your organization succeed or whether you're a woman who leads people, right, embrace the ambition of the people around you, right, and figure out how to tap into that. And so, again, as I said earlier, how do we um, you know, give these, give women, um, and, and I guess everybody, be kind to yourselves. These times are hard. You know, as Gay said, look, women, have, we, we have struggled to manage professional and personal lives, whether it's kids or not, just, it's just, it's a lot to be a mom and a sister and a daughter and also a, you know, a tough nosed business executive, right? It's a lot. Be kind to yourself. And again, be kind to your people, employers. This, there's a lot going on out there right now. It has been for a long time and is right now. So, so I, so I take all that together and say, invest in women, right? I mean, find ways. If I, I remember when I went to Leo Kiley wanting to go on that trip that I mentioned that I, where I met Gay Gaddis, Right, I, the State Department um, asked me to go, but they weren't paying for it. So I had to pay the airfare. Of course, had to pay the airfare to get me over there. And so I went to my boss saying, gosh, the State Department's invited me, but do you wanna pay the, and I was, I thought he'd say no. 
He said, you know, why do you want to go? I told him, he said, go, grow, learn. He invested in me. And I got to tell you, I was loyal. I'm still loyal to this day to Coors and Frito-Lay and, you know, for, for being that sort of boss who invested in me and saw my potential and helped me grow. So meet these women where they are, find a way to help them grow. And it may, you know, it, it may be, you know, full on one year and a little less the next year, right? Figure out, don't give up, work through the short term to get the long-term benefit. Love that message. That's a message that I have for my negotiation students. And that is that Longhorns always ask, you know, asking for those opportunities. And um, as someone who doesn't think that you can even ask, right? There's so many opportunities for you to take advantage of. So thank you for that. So um, we're gonna kick it over to some audience questions um, here. And there were lots of, ch I just love reading this chat. Um, this is gonna be fun to go back and, and read through these comments again, but lots of questions about mentorship. And we had an audience question before, um, emailed before. So how do you suggest finding a mentor? Um, and do you suggest female versus male mentors? What are your thoughts about that? So I'll start. Look, I'm, I'm huge on mentorship. And I will say um, I've had great mentors, as I mentioned. So first of all, mentors can come from lots of places, not likely to be your current boss. Okay, a boss, their job is to think about the organization first. You need a, men a mentor will think about you first. So think about people in your life who know you and want you to succeed. They can be in business. They can be a former boss. They can be a professor. They can be a colleague. I have, I have three women. We're called the Gaslight Girls. <laughs> and and, and they, we've, we've had, we have been together for 20 years being mentors for each other. So look, they can come from lots of places, male and female, absolutely. Um, now, having said that, so, that so, so they can come from lots of places. When you, if you see somebody, this, but this is not the kind of situation where you walk into a cocktail party and say, oh, will you be my mentor, right? You got to build a relationship with someone. They've got to know you well enough to be able to be, give you good perspective based on what will help you succeed. Not them, you. They got to know you. So if you think there's someone you would like to be your mentor, build a relationship, cultivate that relationship, figure out through Zoom, through coffee, whatever it might be, spend some time. Then ask them and be formal about it. Like, I'd love you to mentor me. Would you consider, put a time frame on it, put a year. Would you consider a year? Talking to me, pick a time frame. Once a month, once a quarter, for an hour, right? Who's going to say no to that, okay? If it's a defined period of time, and at the end of the year, if it's working, you can continue. If it's not, you don't have some weird breakup, right? So put a time frame on it. And then, and then frankly, it's your job as the mentee to know what to ask. Don't expect your mentor to come to a conversation prepared to just start throwing advice at you. You got to come with questions. I'm struggling with this at work. You got to be real. Here's what I'm struggling with. How have you ever, have you had a situation like this and how, would you, how did you get through it? Don't ask them to tell you what to do. Ask them to share their experiences, their stories. So come with, so identify mentors, cultivate a relationship, make the ask and come forward with your own questions so that you can get the most out of it. I think Lynn said that very well, but one last thing on mentorship is that as a mentee, you have to think about what you can do for the mentor. It's a two-way street. And yes, you're gonna probably get a lot more from them than they will from you. But there's a reciprocity in that. I have a young man who I keep up with and his dad actually asked me to kind of be his mentor and I did as a favor to him. But what I've found is that I've gotten a lot back from, from Jack, this young man, and he gives me information. He's like, he's out there doing some things in technology that keeps me informed. And so it's, it's a two way street in a lot of ways. So think about that way. You're not just taking as the mentee, you have something to offer. And perhaps if you can position it in that way that, you know, I'm studying this and this, and maybe that would be interesting along the way for you. So think about it as, as a two way street. It's, it's not always just take, take, take. Well, I have this last one. And uh, as we all know, it's been a very tough year. And so it's hard to find people motivated and engaged right now. So can you share some tips for building a passionate, engaged, and motivated team? Well, I have something that I'll throw in real quick. And then Lynn, I think you're about to speak too. Uh, but one thing that was our mantra and really kind of as I was running my company and building a digital technology company, and I still do today, is I have a real simple vision thing. And I know that this sounds a little odd, but we were made it very clear that we were going to thrive in ambiguity. 
And so that was just the way it was. And that's how we would come up with new things. So now more than ever, we're, we've had to thrive in ambiguity, all of us. We don't know sometimes what's going to happen the next day, what laws are going to be in place, what rules we have to follow, what things are going to change in the business community. And so if you can kind of have the mindset that maybe some good things are going to come out of that and that we will just thrive in the unknown and it'll be okay. So that's, a, that's really an interesting way that we motivated people because we'd say, okay, okay, you know, we don't have all the answers right now. We'll be as transparent with you as we can. And we'll always try to be honest with you and authentic, but we're going to make it a celebration to be able to come up with the unknown and innovate and thrive in an ambiguous situation. And this was going on way before COVID. So it's just kind of a, a mindset. I can't, I can't top that. I would just say, look, working in teams has been one of the, for honestly, the great joys of my career. And I, what I did learn over time was to put teams together that didn't look like me, that didn't think like me and had some differences. As Gay said earlier, she's a risk taker. She's an entrepreneur. I'm the most risk averse human being you will ever meet. <laughs> and I learned, and so by the way, I ran R and D at Coors at one point, packaging innovation, you know, how in the world could I possibly have done that job? Well, if I didn't put people around me, who, who would push me out of my comfort zone and get me to take risks. So look, I just think, I think working with teams, you gotta take risks and you gotta work together. This isn't the kind of stuff that happens over happy hour. Teams, you know, just calling yourself a team doesn't work unless you really work through it together. And that's, and so listen, being part of a team is one of the great joys of my career. And um, I wish you all success in finding your similar, your team. A great jewels of my childhood uh, was being a part of, of team right? And um, I love being a part of this team right here. So I'm going to pass it back to, to my teammate, Lynn, to close us out. Thank you so much, Gay and Lynn, for this brilliant, brilliant perspective in this conversation today. Thank you. Wow. I think that's what everybody that's been watching today is saying right now. Um, I am so thrilled to have you both here, Lynn and Gay and Melissa. Great job on getting all those great questions out there and just getting the conversation. It was so much fun and so enlightening to get to hear from you. And if all of you out there would like to hear more about this, as we have mentioned in there, we have the slide up now for the upcoming program, Women Who Mean Business. It will consist of four two-day hands-on sessions here at the University of Texas. It will start in September and will go through March of 2022. And we are posting a link in the chat window. I know Stephanie's been posting it a couple of times, so hopefully you've caught that. But we will also put that in the follow-up email along with the link for the recording for this session. The applications are now open, so please nominate someone or apply for the, for the program yourself. And we really look forward to seeing a bunch of you from here um, in the class. We are now going to close for the day. So I'm going to say thank you again to our panelists and our moderator. And thanks to all of you for sharing your time and energy here with us today. And we will look forward to seeing you in the future. So please watch your email for the recording and follow up information on this program and also for future webinars that we'll be holding. Have a great day.